Welcome to a session on grant funding. This is focused for social scientists and sociologists of religion who are pursuing grant funding for their research. My name is Gerardo Marty, and I'm professor of sociology at Davidson College. I'm also a member of the board of directors at the Louisville Institute. Today, I'm very pleased that we have a wonderful panel of people who will be talking about not only the programs that are available, um, particularly at the Louisville Institute, um, but also experiences that people have had in having their uh, grants uh, funded. So we'll be talking about a lot of different things, giving a lot of advice, giving some direction, sharing um, some sort of background information, and we'll try to be as helpful as possible. Now, while this does not have a chat or interactive feature, you should know that at least with the Louisville Institute, uh, that they are very willing to interact with you about questions um, that you may have about the potential of your own project. And that almost any organization that has grant funding has um, uh, an officer or, uh, or, or different kinds of people who are very willing to interact with you by email, by phone. Uh, and then, of course, um, once you tap into your network of colleagues, you'll have no difficulty finding people who have also had various experiences and often are willing to share um, uh, drafts of their own proposals that will help you out. So I want to encourage you that while this session will give you some experiences and a lot of good information, um, that you should be able to follow up on your own to be able to discover what might be most helpful for you at this moment and the kinds of things that you're trying to figure out for your own research and your own future. So with that, we have a number uh, of really great people who are going to be talking. We're going to uh, talk in turn, so each person will have about 10 minutes to talk, and, um, and then uh, I'll be closing out um, uh, from there. So let me briefly introduce our panelists. Uh, the first will be Edwin Oponte, who's executive director of the Louisville Institute, a Lilly Endowment funded program that's based at Louisville Seminary. Then Don Richter, who is associate director of the Louisville Institute. Um, then we will hear from Rebecca Sager, who is associate professor of sociology at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. Then Gary Adler, who is Assistant Professor of Sociology at Penn State University in Pennsylvania. And then Tia Noel Pratt, who is a sociologist of religion and was recently scholar in residence at the Aquinas Center at Philadelphia and currently President and Director of Research at TN Pratt and Associates, founded in 2018. With that, uh, let's uh, welcome Ed Aponte for his presentation. Ed, be very happy to hear from you. Thanks, Gerardo. Um, I'm going to share my screen here because uh, I think that'll help our conversation and talk a little bit about some of the grants that the Louisville Institute offers uh, for researchers. Uh, my colleague, uh, Associate Director Don Richter, will give some more general comments about how to apply for grants, not only for Louisville Institute, but for other funders as well. So Louisville Institute offers uh, seven research grants for people and doing different things, doctoral fellowships, dissertation fellowships, postdoctoral fellowships, which is a two-year placement on a faculty, uh, first work grants for scholars of colors, project grants for researchers, sabbatical grants for researchers, and pastoral study project grants. Um, I'm going to focus in on some of these that I think are pertinent for our conversation today. And so first book, Grants for Scholars of Color. We established this program in 2003, and so far we've awarded 55 mm -hmm. grants. Um, about $2.1 million uh, has been spent. And um, this is intended to help early career folks, persons of color, get that first book, but in some cases, the second book. Uh, published. We recognize at Louisville Institute that uh, scholars of color in particular have uh, added burdens and we want to make sure that there's an opportunity to get that first or second book published uh, prior to any kind of tenure or contract renewal situation. Uh, the reason why I say second book sometimes is that we also recognize that at some institutions 
uh, how shall I say, the, the institutional attitude is that, well, of course, you are going to publish a revised version of your dissertation, and that's not counted. It's the book after the dissertation that sometimes then is factored into the, the tenure decision or the renewal of the contract. And that's why the Louisville Institute is flexible that way, that we want to make sure that uh, that first book or the first book after the dissertation can get published. So as I say, this is supporting early career non-tenured scholars of religion of color. It is a grant uh, up to $40,000. And I will say here what I say to everyone that whatever the grant says, that if the funding is up to a certain amount, my advice is always apply for that amount. This is not the moment to be humble and, or modest and try to apply for less, thinking that will in, uh, increase your chances. Whatever the amount is, go ahead and apply for that. Uh, the deadline for Louisville Institute is January 15th for this grant. And we are looking at a broad array of disciplines and interdisciplinary work for this grant. Here are some of uh, projects that resulted in books that we have published over the years. Uh, they are historians, they are sociologists of religion, they are theologians, they are um, scholars of, of Bible and other uh, scriptures, and a lot of them are also interdisciplinary in their approach. And these are the books that have resulted from a first book grant for scholars of color. Another uh, grant that we do, and uh, this is particularly among, for sociologists of religion seem to, and anthropologists and historians gravitate to this one, is project grants for researchers. This is for $30,000. It is uh, for focused project. Um, it could be research and study, it could be consultation with two or three scholars. Uh, again, we award this um, every year. The application is due October 1st. We've been doing this since 2010 and have uh, awarded approximately $2.8 million in this program and, and we're delighted to do that. Uh, here are some examples of uh, things we have funded in Project Grant for Researchers and you get a sense uh, again, of the diversity of scholars here and diversity of institutions. Texas A&M University, uh, creating alternative food provision efforts in local congregations. Uh, one of our speakers there, delighted to uh, fund it, Tia Noel Pratt for research in black and Catholic, Catholic and black structure, racism, and identity, and African-American Catholic experience. For a number, I think every wave of the National Congregational Studies Louisville Institute has uh, been pleased to participate and help fund that. Um, and a scholar at Wayne State University, Religion and Political Polarization. Again, this gives you a sense of the, the wide range of uh, uh, research approaches and institutions that Louisville Institute funds in this program project grant for researchers. We also provide sabbatical grants. Uh, these are for $40,000. It's for people who are eligible for a full academic year research leave. Academic is in, in parentheses because we try to be flexible to different calendars of institutions. Uh, so it need not be uh, from uh, September to uh, June kind of thing. So that's something we can talk about. This also established in 2010. We've spent uh, over $4.3 million in this area. And it is, as indicated by its name, things that people do during their sabbatical. It is not uncommon, that is, we do this often, that someone uh, comes to Louisville Institute, gets funded for early stage of research under project grant for researchers, and then comes back and receives a sabbatical grant to finish the project and turn it into that, that final book. And again, to give you a sense of some of the things we have funded in terms of sabbatical in the last couple of years, again, a, a variety of disciplines and interdisciplinary approaches, uh, all kinds of subjects, um, Christianity and the opioid crisis, religion, tax pain, and the contested meaning of political community in the US, uh, the rise and fall of black Catholic education in changing South, 
ethical struggles and catastrophic times, Quakers responses to the Holocaust. Um, a number of a variety of institutions, uh, different approaches, uh, Louisville Institute, we are open to funding all kinds of study on religion and religious communities in the United States and Canada. We also provide a dissertation fellowship that's uh, $25,000 and that's to help someone finish that dissertation. That's it, that's the, the sole requirement, right? Uh, and our hope is that people at that stage of their work, that they will uh, be able to abstain from their half dozen part-time jobs and focus on completing that dissertation. Um, in addition to the, uh, the $25,000 that Louisville Institute provides, we invite the dissertation fellows to Louisville's annual winter seminar. And I should mention, we also invite uh, recipients of uh, project grant for researchers and sabbatical grants for re uh, researchers to the winter seminar, which is a great uh, interdisciplinary, early career, mid-career uh, senior scholars coming together to talk about their research. Uh, some of the dissertation uh, fellows that we funded in the last couple of years, again, you see the variety of what we uh, have been funding and folks uh, coming from all kinds of universities and uh, schools of theology where they're doing their uh, doctoral work. And we're delighted to uh, engage these early career people and help them along with their dissertation fellowship. So that's the work that uh, Louisville Institute does for grants for researchers, first book grants for scholars of color, project grants for researchers, sabbatical grants for researchers, and dissertation fellowships. Uh, these are things that uh, Louisville Institute does, but there are other funders who do similar things. Uh, as you explore possibilities to get funding for your own research, we'd be delighted here at Louisville Institute to talk to you about not only applying for us, but to give you some feedback, some insight, some help as you consider under other funders as well. So uh, with that, I think I will turn this back to Gerardo. Thanks very much, Ed, that was excellent. Let's move on to Don. Don, you'll be sharing uh, more and give some, I think, tips and advice. Uh, so Don. Hello, I'm delighted to be uh speaking with this audience about our uh, research grant programs. And we're gonna focus in today, uh, especially on the project grant for researchers. Since as uh, Ed said, that is one of the primary ones that um, this audience, sociologists of religion will apply for. Um, I want to say uh, I'm, I'm the primary contact person for all the research grants if you want to explore feasibility uh, with us about the project that you have in mind. And I'll say more about that later, but um, what I'm going to say now, these, these 10 tips that we'll offer are um, all on the website in the application guides, which are already available online. So go to our website and look at a particular program and you'll see what I'm going to share now um, is, is right up there. So we'll go through our 10 tips here. And in good biblical fashion, uh, we have the, we call them 10 commandments. In fact, uh, each one of these starts out in, with a negative expression don't do something, and, and that will open up for you the, the, uh, a better way to do it, to approach it, okay? So for each one of these, we start out with the, the negative, but it opens the door for the positive, what we wanna encourage. And you'll see most of these will relate not just to Louisville Institute grants, but to grant programs across the board, okay? The first commandment. <laughs> Don't pose a loaded research question. Instead, ask a question that requires investigation, uh, a question to which you do not already know the answer. Uh, 
Okay. The second is don't request funds simply to package and share what you've already learned. We prefer that you, uh, we prefer projects that show potential for new empirical inquiry and discovery for generating and analyzing reliable new data. Okay. The third is don't request funds for basic operational costs. Instead, these grants enable something special, something over and above your daily work, the work that is funded by existing resources. Don't request funds for a one-off event, uh, such as a, a one conference, one kind of workshop. Instead, budget for project activities that strategically support your research with additional resources of time, such as a course buyout, with tools such as interview and uh, transcription and coding or software, and with talent such as research assistants. So we, we prefer even if you're going to do some consultation with a a group of people that you do that over time and not just as a one-off event. The fifth tip is don't try to cram all your big picture research goals into a single grant funded project. Instead, identify a manageable, coherent subset of project activities that will contribute significantly to your larger research plans. So, you may have in mind uh, a major study like the, the fourth wave of the congregational research, and that's got lots of moving parts, and there's no way we can, our grants will fund that big enterprise, but they come to us and say, if you give us some additional money, we can add these questions to, to the protocol when we interview people and focus in this way. So they, they viewed our grant as a subset uh, of their larger project. Likewise, that's often a good way to approach it. Um, if, if you've got a project that's gonna last um, over several years or encompass a lot of different activities. Don't describe research methods in a single sentence how often we've seen, I plan to conduct ethnographic research using mixed methods. <laughs> Instead, include specific details about your research protocols and procedures for data gathering and analysis. Don't use excessive jargon. Some technical language may be necessary, but craft your proposal in clear, accessible prose that can be grasped by academic colleagues from another field. Because those will be the kind of people that are reading your grant proposal in our selection committees. We'll have someone who represents usually sociology of, of religion, but we'll also have historians, you know, constructive theologians, biblical scholars. So you, you want to uh, pitch your project in a way that it makes sense to them. Don't assume institutional support. If your project involves academic leave, a course buyout, or IRB approval, talk with your dean or department head straight away to get the ball rolling. This is especially the case for a lot of sociology projects, uh, research involving human subjects. We, we look to see that either IRB approval is, has been granted or is pending on a lot of those um, uh, grant proposals. So take care of that, you know, far enough in advance before you apply to us. Don't ask just anyone to write a letter of recommendation for you. Writing reference letters is an art. So recruit colleagues who are especially skilled in crafting letters that make a compelling case for you and for your project. Those are the two main letters. One puts you in the spotlight more, 
one puts your project in the spotlight. You don't even have to know that person well, someone who can grasp the significance of your project and, and has a sense that you're the right person to be conducting it. Those people uh, would, could make a strong case for you. And of course, don't pro procrastinate. As soon as you have a research project in mind, email me a brief outline to receive feasibility feedback. You're just going to say, here's my core question. Here are the project activities that are going to help me address that question. And, you know, he here's my institutional setting. Just enough uh, information to really allow us to say, yes, these, uh, this topic seems to fit the funding criteria for what we have in mind for this grant. And so we'll be glad to uh, help you discern whether to take next steps and develop it into a full proposal, or if you do it far enough in advance, you can reboot a bit, recalculate, and send another feasibility statement that is more in line with our criteria. So we, uh, we look forward to receiving these proposals. I'm Every day now, I'm working on feasibility feedback requests for PGR and for the other programs. It, the work continues apace. So we look forward to hearing from some of you uh, when the time is right. Back to you, Gerardo. Okay. That's perfect, thank you. Uh, and now we'll move on to our next panelist, to uh, Rebecca. Rebecca, very glad to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, first, I just wanted to say thank you, Gerardo, for inviting me. And I also wanted to say thank you to the Louisville Institute for funding my work all the way from my dissertation, which was just a few years ago, uh, <laughs> until recently, uh, um, different research projects that I've worked on. So thank you very much for all your support. I wouldn't be where I am without your funding. Um, all right, so I'm actually going to reiterate, um, I'm going to bring up some new things, but also reiterate a few points that Gerardo, Ed, and Don all brought up. Um, so I guess there may be important ones since we're all <laughs> thinking the same way. Um, so maybe I'm a strange person, but I actually enjoy the grant writing process. Um, for me, I find that it really helps uh, bring things into focus for my project. Um, so I'm going to start with that part. So when you're starting your grant uh, writing, I think there's a few things that you really need to make sure are very, very clear in any grant proposal you're writing. First, I mean, that's these may sound kind of simple, but um, I've read some grants and they're not always there. So uh, first, um, what is your research question or questions? You know, make sure that's really clear at the front end that you're telling people what you're really specifically studying. Um, and then as I believe Don said and, and Ed too, be really clear about your methods. Um, so how are you actually going to answer those questions? Um, and this me brings me back to one of the Ten Commandments Don just mentioned, uh, don't use jargon. <laughs> so I know we get very kind of uh, specific um, within our own disciplines and can have a tendency to rely on uh, disciplinary language, but when you're writing grant proposals, unless it's for something like an NSF sociology grant, um, as Don mentioned, people from a number of different disciplines are going to be reading your grant proposals. So when you're thinking about your methods, your question, um, why the project is important, which pretty much every grant wants you to talk about why the project is important, you're gonna wanna think about things outside of your own discipline. So how does this work maybe have an impact, you know, on the, the real world um, that's not just sociology or political science? Um, when you're writing your grant, I think it really helps because it helps to bring clarity to your project because you are usually given a you know word limit and very specific prompts to answer and so you have to be specific 
and you have to be very clear. Um, and so I definitely think this goes back to what both Ed and Don said. Um, it's very important to have someone else beside yourself read the project, to send an inquiry in earlier, does this fit in with the goals of the organization, and make sure that you're specific about what you're doing and how, what the end product of that research is going to be. So are you looking at a book? Are you looking at articles? Um, so first question, second methods, third, why is this project important? And fourth, what are your end product? Um, I think that writing a grant and thinking about those things and being specific and clear um, then helps you when you're thinking about what organizations you're going to apply to get funding from. So um, I think sometimes when we're looking at sociology of religion, we only think maybe uh, groups that study religion specifically or are interested in religion specifically are going to be the ones that are going to fund us. That's not true. Um, there are a wide variety of organizations that you can apply to for assistance that are outside of just religion specifically. So for example, uh, Gary and I are currently working on a project uh, that got funded by a nonprofit institute. Um, so when you're writing these different grant proposals, then you can start maybe thinking about who else is going to be interested in this work that's outside of the more kind of traditional uh, religious organizations. Um, and then um, once you are really in the process of writing the grant, then I think it's really, really important to think about what are the goals of the organization. So um, read about the organization that you're applying um, to get funding from. Uh, what kinds of projects have they funded in the past? What are, what is their mission? What are their goals? Be really clear about that in your actual grant writing. Um, Cause you want to make sure that what you're doing is something that they're actually interested in. And you're not just kind of, you know, throwing grants <laughs> out there and hoping something sticks, right? So you want to make sure that you're not wasting their time and your own time by applying to groups that aren't going to be interested in your funding. Of course, uh, as Don mentioned, um, the first step in that is writing a letter of inquiry and kind of, you know, seeing if they're interested in what you're doing before you even start that whole process. Um, I also highly, highly recommend uh, reading previous successful grant proposals. Um, sometimes those are on organizations websites, sometimes just the name of people who got the grants are on their websites. Um, if the grants aren't actually up, I would say contact uh, people who look like they've done research similar to yours and see if they're willing to share their successful proposals. I have found that people are very generous with their time and assistance. Uh, you know, I think people mostly <laughs> want to help others and make sure they're successful also. And of course, reach out to the grant officer and the organization um, for any help, assistance, or clarity. Um, and so when you are reading the past proposals, um, I think it's really important to think about how did they frame it? Why was their work something the organization was interested in? Um, do you think that the project you're working on can offer uh, something similar to the organization? And um, finally, uh, I would say make sure uh, that you have someone read your application before you turn it in. Uh, you know, I mean, I, we're all smart people, but we all miss things. And so uh, having another set of eyes on any application is really, really, really important, um, I think, to making sure something is successful. And I guess that's actually not my totally final point. Um, final, final point is then uh, 
besides the dissertation grant and dissertation work, once you're moved on from that, um, I have found that my most successful projects have been collaborative projects. And so don't, you know, don't feel like something isn't going to be successful or as important if you're working with others on it. Um, other people offer different insights and um, different points of view than your own. And then you already have a built in uh, someone else to show your work to. <laughs> Thank you so much. Super helpful. Super helpful. Uh, and um, especially appreciate this idea of not only being able to find uh, the proposals or the names of people and follow up with them, but the fact that I think a lot of people are genuinely wanting to be helpful and that um, those colleagues out there can be really tremendous. Great. Let's move on. Gary, uh, pleased to hear from you and um, uh, take it away. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Gerardo, for organizing. Um, and thank you also, echoing Rebecca to the Louisville Institute. Uh, I believe um, they've funded me, they have funded me since dissertation stage uh, and are still funding me right now. Um, so it's been a, a wonderful source of research support for me, as well as, importantly, um, a parallel or I should say expanded intellectual community um, of scholars who are doing similar research. Uh, I'm in the lucky location of having of almost being at the end, so I can do a lot of echoing uh, of tips that we've already heard. Let me do a couple of echoes and then I'll drill down on a, a couple more specific points. Uh, the first is that it's important in the stages of, of working on a grant um, to get feedback. Um, I think Don actually has been a, a pretty good um, mentor or ally for me in, in this because um, Don was one of the first foundation officers I ever interacted with. And to see that um, that the process of writing a grant isn't just trying to kind of figure out which key goes in the keyhole that you can spring the lock of, but instead actually be working with a foundation officer who actually wants you to kind of make a better key, right? And convincing you that um, the, the hole for the key is a lot bigger than you would think it was. Um, so Don was great at kind of convincing me of the importance of feedback. And then, of course, my own peers, as well as earlier stages in my career, mentors or advisors were also very important in feedback. Um, a second point I want to echo that we've heard a couple of times is the importance of a broad hook. We know as readers, within less than a paragraph, when an author is being straight with us, and when we can trust where an author is taking us. My hunch is that's even more important for grant writing um, because there could be such a flurry of proposals coming to a, a, funder, a funding agency. And so being able to say right out of the gate in non-jargony language um, what the importance of the project is and how um, the project will further a, a specific goal is just really important um, to pull off. And it's hard to pull off. It's oftentimes the last part of a grant application that I get right. Um, so it's important to kind of keep revisiting that and applying. Then uh, the next thing I'd echo is that um, grant uh, in the grants process is really, you, you should try to understand it as um, kind of a continu continuing overlapping way to develop your interests and your projects. Rebecca alluded to a project that we're working on right now. Um, we actually have grants from three different funders for this project. The, as Don mentioned, um, uh, Louisville is happy to, to, to fund discrete parts of a project and other funders are similar. And what's neat is when you can kind of carve out ways for funders to hook into your project and then use funding to build the project over time. This is especially important as you start to aim at larger uh, grant giving bodies, because a lot of times they want to see pilot data. They want to know, um, are your concepts legit? Um, can you actually do the methods you say you can do? And will the methods that you want to do actually lead to, to new knowledge? Um, and, and kind of getting on like a, almost a, a ladder of grants can really help uh, to achieve that. And then finally, the last thing that I would echo um, before drilling down on a few of these points is that methods are important. I think uh, uh, Don <laughs> gave a great example when he said, don't tell us you want to use qualitative research to do something. Actually, 
describe to us what that research looks like, what are the pros and cons of it, um, and how you'll know uh, if it's working or, or whether you need to revise it in the midst of the, of the stream. Uh, the methods in our discipline are really kind of everything in terms of not only where we get exciting insights, but how we can actually speak to each other about the, the validity of the conclusions that we're making. So actually giving us a, some detail about, or actually a lot of detail about those methods um, is just as exciting um, and as important as filling in some of the literature loopholes. Now let me shift uh, to a little bit more of a motivational message which is I would like listeners to know that there are pots of gold out there. There are actually lots of pots of gold out there. And a lot of these pots of gold don't have enough people trying to get their hands in it and getting some of those resources. Um, I was thinking about um, my, in my own work, all the different places that I've gone for bits of money. Um, these include getting up departmental chairs, especially this can be especially effective for graduate students. It includes pots of money that oftentimes divisions and colleges within a university will have, which they have to distribute on an annual basis. Almost every single institute or center on a university, uh, whether um, a liberal arts college or a state university like mine, has small pots of money that they wanna give to get projects off the ground. These could be $1,000, these could be $2,000. And sometimes it can feel as if um, going after small pots is not worth it. But in the land of grants, getting one grant has a way of helping you get other grants. So as social scientists, we know that the Matthew effect exists, right? So why not avail yourself of that effect? Why not um, secure small grants or early grants as a way of signifying to future funders um, that they should invest of you? So I wanna encourage you that there are pots of money out there and that pots of money can add up and speak in a way that's different than just the very discrete purpose um, that they're given to you for. Um, related to that, um, I would say that a lot of funding competitions or a lot of grant, uh, annual grant competitions often don't get enough applications. I don't know how true that is in Louisville's experience. It, it might not be true, but I know for some of uh, associations uh, within sociology of religion, in some years there, there simply is kind of low competition which means that in some years, the odds of actually receiving funding uh, can be pretty high. Um, this may change uh, in years like COVID or, and when uh, people are looking for money to just keep their careers going. But nonetheless, I think it's important to, to not kind of get yourself out of the game before the game has um, already started because your odds might be better than, um, than you realize you are. Um, one of the main points I wanna drill home is, and I especially heard this as Rebecca was talking, is how much time and focus writing a good grant takes. Um, it is really important to take your time, not only to increase your odds of landing a grant, but because your peers, people showing up on this video, are gonna read whatever you send in when they make award decisions. And you don't want to send in things um, that, that signal to your peers that you, you kind of don't know what you're up to. Um, and you want them to be excited. One of the most fun things about uh, serving on committees to distribute grants is to learn and is to be excited about sort of the cutting edge research um, that's coming out in a, a field. And I think it's important Given, um, given those comments to realize that a funding proposal is, is probably different than any other piece of writing that we do. In graduate school, you're mostly trained for a very technical sort of writing to either get a proposal for research through um, or to uh, publish an article um, or maybe a book. But a funding proposal is very different. It, it's much trimmer, uh, it's much more punchy, and it has to have a very clear thread to go through a short uh, amount of space. And so when you hear the words funding proposal, what I always encourage is focusing on the second word, which is it's a proposal. Um, the funding will come if the proposal is done correctly. Um, and so without a good idea, without a good research uh, design and without a connection to the funding audience, it's just hard um, for that to land uh, in, in, in for you to, to receive the monies to do what you wanna do. Uh, and finally, let me uh, end with saying that 
reaching out for help on the things that you don't know yet is really important. So for example, in, in one of my first grants, I reached out to somebody because I just wanted to see what a budget looked like. I didn't know um, that you could you know, ask for a recorder as well as printer paper, as well as transcription, that there's all sorts of categories that you might not realize um, that you're spending your own time and energy on and hence your own money on that you can ask funders for and being able to see what that looks like uh, is really important. And then on the, the other side of that, when you do get funded, it's really important to, to ask questions of your funder when you run into time problems or when you want to spend money uh, in new ways. Uh, a, an example of, in a current project I have with Louisville Institute is um, that we, we ended up having a little bit of extra money uh, within our budget and we asked Don whether we could reallocate that in the exact same um, uh, research design of the grant but kind of expand to a new research uh, site. And the funder was willing to do that. You know, uh, Don asked for some legitimation, you know, how this would add to the project and it was able to be done. So that sort of interactive relationship um, and asking when you don't know is important when you get on the other side of the grant as well. And I was gonna end with that, but let me end with the last one, which is tell the world that you got a grant. Uh, do it in this order. Tell your advisor, if you're a graduate student, tell your department chair, whether you're a graduate student or a faculty member, put it on your CV and then tweet the heck out of it. Um, it gives people a chance to celebrate, but it also is kind of like the opening of Star Wars. You know something that's great is coming. And so we know to expect in 18 months, uh, a cool publication coming out of that. So thanks for having me. I hope this has helped a little bit and feel free to reach out to me if, if I can uh, be of help. That was great. Uh, so the accumulation of advice that we're getting here is great, but I also appreciated the Star Wars shout out. So thank you so much, Gary. That was- Hey, I, I've been watching a lot of movies this summer. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> thanks, uh, we're glad to move on. Um, thank you so much for Tia for being with us. Uh, I know she has wonderful things to share. Tia? Thank you, Gerardo. And thank you for inviting me to be here today. And I also want to thank the Louisville Institute for its support of my work uh, over these last few years. And I want to echo everything that's already been said, but I also want to kind of sp uh, focus on a few key things that fall under the headings of persistence, apply for the right grant, and know your application audience. So I'll kind of talk about all of those things in telling my Louisville Institute story. So I got my own Louisville grant uh, on my third try. Uh, before that, I benefited from a grant that Gary had gotten um, in conjunction with uh, Trisha Bruce and Brian Starks for the American Parish Project in which I was a participant and culminated, guess what I have on my desk? American Parishes, chapter six, that's, that's the one you wanna read. Uh, of course, that one's mine. Uh, so, you know, I, I, like I said, I didn't get my, my own Louisville grant until the third try. I, mean, I, I initially applied for a dissertation grant that didn't work out. And then years later, I applied for the first book grant for scholars of color. And I had gone to a conference, I think it was SSSR, and Ed was available and we sat down and we had a great talk about my project, about ways that would fit uh, with the Louisville Institute and I applied and it didn't work out and I was incredibly disappointed because I knew it was a strong application. So that was perhaps triple uh, SRs in October. So the following August, I was at ASR ASA and Don was there and there was a, a session, this basically this session at that conference and I almost didn't go, I almost didn't go. And then I went and two things happened. Uh, Wendy Kedge was uh, at Brandeis was a panelist that day, and she said something that has stayed with me ever since. She said a funder's mission, a funder's goal is to advance their mission, not yours. And so you have to figure out a way to make your project fit in with the funder's goal. And that really was eye opening to me to have it articulated in that concise way. And you know, with 
you know, I, I work in the nonprofit sector now, and you know, that's something I, I tell folks all the time when they're they're looking to get funding. You know, you have to find a way to help the funder advance their goals. But in the, the conversation that, that took place that day, I realized that where I was in my project, that I had applied for the wrong grant, that I just wasn't in the right point in the project to apply for the first book grant, because the first book grant is really a writing grant, and I still needed to collect data. And so that was August, and the as, as Ed told us, the the project grant for researchers deadline is October 1st. So I, I rushed home and after having a, a talk with Don, I, I you know I went home and and got my materials together and, and worked really hard over a short period of time to get th that application together for October 1st and it was successful. So you know persistence applying for the right grant is, is really important. Um, in terms of getting, you know, letters and getting feedback on your application, you know, one thing that I, I recommend and I, has been helpful for me is to look to folks in your networks who have been funded by the funder you are applying to because they have a sense of what, what it takes to be successful. And as Rebecca said, you know, folks tend to be uh, incredibly generous and will um, gladly help, you know, in, in any way they can. So my my project, which, which is a book project, has funding from two sources, from, from the Louisville Institute and uh, smaller but still very impactful funding uh, in the form of Jack Shan Grant from the uh, Society for the Scientific Study of Religion. So, um, and, you know, really kind of know your audience in the sense that, and this is really emphasizing the, the jargon piece. Um, I think that was point seven that Don made, commandment seven in his, the seventh commandment in his uh, presentation. That is so key um, because you can't assume that the people reading your application, even if they are fellow sociologists, are, spend as much time on the intricacies of the topic that you do. They're, they're not necessarily going to be the five people that work in the very specific area that you do. So, and being able to communicate your work to a broader audience is very important, uh, no matter what. And so to be able to do that, you know, kind of a, a, an early stab at that is in a, a funding application. So, you know, uh, persistence, apply for the right grant, and, and know, know your audience. Um, so I want to, and you know, to, to emphasize a point that, that Gary made, you know, uh, smaller grants can lead to bigger grants. Um, so whether it's your, your department or perhaps the College of Arts and Sciences or School of Theology, whatever it happens to be, um, for the, the Association for the Sociology of Religion has a program, the, the Fichter Grant. And the Fichter Grant, and I was on the committee for the Fichter Grant this year, and it was my, my first time reading applications and making those kinds of decisions, and it was eye-opening uh, for me, and I, I learned a lot from the process. One, one thing I learned is people, People who write in a lot of jargon tend not to get funded. Those of, of the applications that we read, those that were heavily um, written and written in heavy jargon were far less likely to get support from, from the committee as those that were written in, in clear, concise language that was uh, applicable to, to a broader audience. So, so the Victor Grant funds, uh, and this is taken right from the website, Promising Sociological Research on Women in Religion or on the Intersection Between Religion and Gender or Religion and Sexualities. Uh, typically, the Victor Grant has a pool, a pot really, of, of $12,000 that can be distributed. Um, applications are uh, at a maximum of $5,000. Sometimes they're funded, the, sometimes applications are funded in their entirety, sometimes they're partially funded. 
Uh, but you know that that amount of money, especially for someone who is a graduate student, can lead to a lot of, of bigger things. If you have received two thousand dollars, five thousand dollars from something like the Victor Grant, that tells funders that have larger amounts to distribute that this is somebody who's doing great work. This is somebody whose work has received funding. As, as, uh, as a friend said to me, isn't it great when somebody says, we really like your work, here's some money so that you can, you can do some more because we want to see some more. I mean, that, that's really a, a great thing. So I, I guess I'll just um, kind of wrap up by saying, you know, those, those, three, those three points that I started off with, persistence, apply for the right grant, and know your, know your audience. Thank you, Gerardo. Wow, that was great. That was so good. <laughs> so the, the, uh, we're gonna close, but I first wanna just pat myself on the back for putting together <laughs> such a great panel. Um, we were able to uh, hear from the, uh, a grant agency, an insider perspective of what they respect, the kinds of things that matter to them, as well as a few programs that may be relevant to your research. And then from Rebecca, Gary, and Tia, we were able to hear really excellent on the ground advice from people who have been successful and who've been able to also review uh, other uh, proposals and to be able to see the process of how decisions are made. And so all of this is valuable. The best part about this whole panel is that it's recorded. So if you missed a point or if you want to go back and go, what was that again? Or let me revisit that. Then you can certainly go back and listen more. Let me take a, another moment to say thank you so much. Really appreciate your time, the expertise that you've offered here, and the generosity of your being able to share your own experience. So with that, thank you so much for being a part of this session. And uh, we look forward to hearing success stories of the funding of your own research.